Hey, everybody. I, I'm a little concerned because I'm the red shirt on the stage today. That puts me in a bad place. Well, well, Did you wear that shirt just so you could make that joke? Uh, no, actually, I didn't. I, I, I actually wore this shirt because it was the clean one. I, we normally, my crew normally wears Hawaiian shirts, and I forgot my Hawaiian shirt for today, so I had to find a better shirt, so it turned out to be the, as my wife calls it, the burgundy shirt. But yes, well, welcome, sir. Thank you for being with us here today. Pleasure. Excellent. Uh, before we uh, go into uh, a, a journey where we uh, go beyond sight and sound, or <laughs> where we, we travel beyond... Different show. Yes. Uh... I'm curious how you stumbled into this life. So, as a, as a person, I know you, you have a, a BA, you, you went to college, you, you have a, a, a worldly experience, but how did you get into this dream, so to speak? Well, um, I was, we have this thing in, in Tennessee that we do in the summer, some states do it called governor school. And it's when uh, high achieving students want to basically go to college for the summer. And uh, I went to our school for Tennessee studies um, the summer after my sophomore in high school. And uh, one of the things that they took us to do on the weekend was we went to a famous regional theater called the Barter Theater in just over the state line in Virginia. And they, um, it was my first time seeing a play. And I thought I, it was gonna bore me to tears. And I, it was called The Voice of the Prairie. And it was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever seen people do together. And then um, a lot of my friends in high school had started getting into theater and I, I talked to my wrestling coach and said, hey, this is something I wanna, I think I wanna get into and focus on and he allowed me to split my time between practice and rehearsal. And then um, I decided to study it, and I went to a very good liberal arts college, Swanee, Tennessee, and I uh, majored in theater in a small but very good program that Tennessee Williams left his entire estate to. And they sent me to study in New York for a semester, which kind of uh, opened up that scary city to a young man. And then I applied to graduate school, and I got into Columbia, and I studied the classics for three years. And then I was like fortunate enough, uh, s uh, some agents at William Morris happened to be in the audience for something, and signed me when I was still in school. And then uh, I just started working, and I, I, I still feel like nobody really has asked me if I want to do this. <laughs> do you want to do this? <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's, been, it's you know. Uh, I, I think, um, I don't know why I'm like this, but um, storytelling is very important to me. And I think it's important to us. I think there's something intrinsic in human nature. There's something, of, we're, uh, you know, we're social animals. Yes. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the, the death of movies or the death of movie theaters. And I actually don't think that's ever going to happen because I think that there's something in our makeup that always will always want to gather around the fire together yes. and hear a story told. Absolutely. And and it's intrinsic in our nature as as communities to build communities and tell our stories and then also project our future into ourselves and say, where are we going with this? And we imagine new things. And that's what this con is about is both innovation and culture coming together. Uh, <clears throat> as you went through, because it, a, a start in theater is not always a start in cinema, and theater is can be uh, very up close and can be very raw because you're in the room with the people in the moment. Was there a particular production or play that really sort of catapulted you even further on that road? Uh, it w I mean, the first play I did, I was like the guard in Twelve Angry Men, <laughs> right? But. That first performance, uh, when I walked out on the stage, um, and I felt that connection yeah. with the audience, um, it was that prototypical lightning strike mm. of 
love at first sight, and I, I, I remember it like it literally was like yesterday. Um, and I, there was just no going back from there. Um, I mean, there are a lot of high points along along the way. Oh yeah. You know, doing my first New York play, um, having my life threatened. <laughs> um, you had your life threatened? Yeah, my first uh, show was uh, Corpus Christi by Terrence McNally. And oh. uh, we ended up having to do the show with metal detectors and bomb sniffing dogs. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously my first movie, Tully, uh, is still one of my favorites. And, it's been a, it's been a great great and obviously you know Helen Wheels was a chapter of my life. Oh, I, there are many Helen Wheels fans here. Trust me. I know that's been that's been interesting at these cons. I've seen the several Helen people Wheels. dressed as you. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, is there a role that a, a more classic role, not necessarily an invented role, but is there a role that you would love to t step in the shoes for and put your own stitch on? Oh, there's many. I mean, I really think it's time to play Astronov mm -hmm. and Uncle Vanya. Um, I was going to do that, that fell apart. Uh, I'd love to do Night of the Iguana. Ooh. And um, I really, there's an obscure Jacobean play called The Changeling by Tom, Thomas Middleton yeah, yeah. that I'd really like to play to Flores. Um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot. I, I kind of went through my Hamlet phase, I'm not interested in that anymore. You're over Shakespeare. I did my, my I, I did get to do my dream role in Chekhov. Uh, I played Solioni and the Three Sisters. Great cast. Uh, Peter Sarsgaard uh, played uh, um, uh, was it Vershin? Yeah. Uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal played Masha. Um, who else was in that show? Well, Marin Ireland. Played, Chekhov is uh, that's off. Josh the Hamilton was playing. Andre, it was a really good cast. Excellent. So, as your journeys continue, you've done film, you've done TV, and now you're stepping into the shoes of uh, a character who has some establishment in, in a world that is massive, it is broad beyond a measure. Um, to boldly go where no one has gone before is, is a small statement when we talk about how the Star Trek universe has influenced both culture and science. Um, and we've had panelists here who've been on many sides of the, the, the Star Trek curtain from scientists who've influenced the art to people who have been in the art and influenced the science. And you're stepping into a role that I, I personally have always loved it, and when uh, several actors have, have portrayed it, it's always been nice to see, but I'm looking forward to, to you putting in on that particular uniform uh, for us. So how did you get on this particular track? How did you start your, your bold journey, I should say? Well, I, um, the, the creators had been talking to me the year previous about Lorca, and they very wisely hired Jason Isaacs. <laughs> and I'm glad they hired Jason Isaacs <laughs> because they came back to me the next year and said, hey, we got this new captain named Captain Parker. Uh, would you mind putting yourself on tape? And I was like, yeah, of course. You know? But in my mind, I was thinking, that's a boring name for a captain, but okay. <laughs> and uh, they called me the Peter next Parker. day. Peter Parker. Yeah, they called me the next day and said, okay, you got it, and it's actually Captain Pike. Thought I have chills right out. now. I have chills, you know, because I've been been a, a Trekkie for a very long time. So that, um, yeah, that that um, blew my mind. And then, wa you know, walking on the set for the first time, sitting in the chair for the first time. Literally, it's really it's the job has remained uh, surreal to me for the longest. I mean, I did a movie with Robert De Niro. Yeah, I I just did a movie with Anthony Hopkins. There is nothing more surreal than finding yourself on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. So you you mentioned that you're a Trekkie. My question too is is uh, do you have a particular flavor of Star Trek? Is there a, a cast or, or show that that you you hone in on, or is it just all broad, all across the board? You know, I I grew up on the original in syndication, uh, so I. I have to pay homage to that, uh, it, but then you know the next generation was high school for me. But then when I got into college, I, I 
stopped watching TV and suddenly it was seven years later. So I've got a lot to catch up on still on the next generation. Um, but those two, were, you know, those are seminal. Excellent. If you could have stepped into those casts, would you would you want to play a character that already exists, or would you want to step into a new role? I think Data was like the best. <laughs> I met Brent finally, finally met Brent in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and he he uh, got out of his car and he goes, "Hey man," and I was like, "Hey, finally," and he goes, "Man," he sits down and it turns out he's a huge Helen Wheels fan. He's seen every episode. <laughs> and that's all he wanted to talk about. All yeah. I wanted to talk about was data. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You're Star Trek. No, no, Helen Wheels. Yeah. I, I, it was like my father was a, a sports writer, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, but originally he wrote uh, theology. And he was invited uh, to a, um, a worldwide religious conference hosted by um, Sun Young Moon in the 1980s. And he, he went because uh, he wanted to talk to Sun Young Moon about religion and evangelicalism in, in South Korea. And uh, all he got there, and it turned out all that Sun Young Moon wanted to talk about was football. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's your mom. So your dad was a sports writer. Your mom was in golf, right? My mother was a professional golfer. Nice, nice. That, that's that's a match right there. Um, when when you got offered the role and you knew you were going to step onto the to the to this set, was there anything you did to uh, bolster yourself for that, or did you feel like you were instantly prepared for it? Uh, pray. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, there wasn't a lot to go on with Pike, so you try to take your writer's cues. Um, Sinequa helped me a lot um, because, yeah, uh, great leader. And um, uh, there's there's one moment where she was kind of without being so harsh about it. She's like, you know, you're being kind of being Bohannon right now. I was like, oh really? Okay. I need to soften that up then. Um, but really just um, trying to listen to the rest of the cast and the writers and the directors and hope for the best. Indeed. Uh, so you you were in Hell on Wheels. Uh, you've done your film work, you've done TV work, um, you're you're uh, have a Marvel experience now. Um, and you also uh, do a, a podcast as well. It's called The Well. And and how did that journey start for you? The Well came out of um, an idea that I'd had many years ago um, that I wanted to do. I didn't even know what medium, but I wanted to do something that was an interview-based program that uh, instead of asking everybody the, about the thing we already knew them for. Yes. I wanted to ask people about the thing that we didn't know that they do. Yeah. Right. Um, like, uh, for instance, uh, we have an episode I, I just published recently uh, talking to Alice Cooper about golf, and he almost went professional. Right. And um, we have an interview with Ewan Rayon from Game of Thrones and The Inhumans, who turns out is a tremendous songwriter. Uh, but then we, we also wanted to branch out to people that aren't necessarily household names but are doing incredible things with creative thinking and high level problem solving. So actually I went to um, the uh, National Science Center in Ottawa, Canada uh, to meet the team that created the Kibble Balance mm -hmm. that helped provide um, the natural constant for the kilogram, yeah. which is the last natural constant conversion and the hardest, like this machine they built had to do like 12 measurements at the same time, including the gravitational field in the room. Like it's an insane machine that they built. Um, we have an um, interview with a, our first, our first episode is with a, a maritime historian that uncovered a very famous shipwreck. And so we try to come at creativity from, from every different angle. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's my uh, creative well outside of acting. When I, when I finish a job, I don't have to ask what I'm going to do next. I just have stuff to edit. So, and then these are, I brought cards. If anybody didn't get one at the table and you want to get one after the panel, I'll just leave them here and you can grab one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And it's called The Well. The Well. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's on every major 
platform, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. And you say we, who's your collaborator? Then? Brandon Edgens, who um, I met when I was 18 years old uh, at a cast party <laughs> for the Trojan Women. Uh, <laughs> and uh, is still my best friend. And uh, it's our thing that we do together and have complete control over. And he's also the smartest person. <laughs> well, usually I find any success I have with a partner is because they're the smartest person and I'm not. So, um, uh, so with this this well that you've created, um, has there been any particular um, story that you stumbled on because of it that was su surprising? Like, did you go in assuming, like you said, you're looking for the story untold, the question unanswered? Was yeah. there anyone in particular that you were like, wow? Well, a couple of things. Je uh, Coach June Jones, who took the, the, in 1998, the Hawaii Warriors were ranked 112 out of 112 teams in the NCAA. The next year, uh, Coach June Jones left, he left the Chargers, head coaching position of the Chargers, in a winning, in a winning season, turned down the next contract to go take a third of the pay, and took the same roster of players, actually cut the two top ranked players because they were jerks and won the Western Conference. And it's about how did he take a culture of losing and turning it into a culture of winning. And he just simply started doing the opposite of what every coach does. Um, there were days they wouldn't have practice. They would just sit in a circle and talk. Uh, he, um, uh, the players came to him with the idea of introducing the Hawka chant before the games. He said yes. He, he hired a linguist at the university to create, and they were using their, their, fight, their fight song was the Hawaii Five-O theme song, <laughs> right? And he said no. So he hired a, the ling university linguist to come up with a uh, Polynesian fight song. Uh, found out that the number one selling color of jerseys is black and changed the jerseys to black because he wanted more jerseys on the street. He got the rainbow off of the helmet. <laughs> and then he started making um, promotional videos for their commercials and there, he was just like, give me all the video of all the hardest hits. And just stuff like that, you know, um, and, and claiming that the, his, his secret is love. Um, and then there's also Ward Fleming, the, do you know the pin screen? You know that thing? That novelty toy, you put your hand in it and it makes a perfect impression with all these pins. Ward Fleming invented that. And um, his, the, the newest stuff he's working with, he's working with ball bearings on a gravitational, or a, a vibrating surface. And um, it is the only uh, physical representation of BZ motion that, is ever, that has been discovered. Wow. And BZ motion is the motion of, of uh, uh, liquid, crystals uh, at the, well, at, at maybe plasma crystals at, that you can only find at the hearts of, of giant planets, say Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> didn't expect that. You know, just think, yeah, you run into crazy stuff all the time. So you've got the well to go back to when you need to fill back up. Yeah. You, know, you, you do your, your con life, you do your, you know, theater and film. Um, are there... Are there other pursuits or avenues that you're starting to take on? I know you got married last year, um, and I'm sure that's a, a whole other journey in of itself. But ha has there been other pursuits that, that are now on the horizon that you're looking forward to? Yeah, I, you know, we, we just bought my first house. And, um, you know, I was, a, I was a stage carpenter when I was in college and never thought I would want to utilize those skills again. <laughs> but as, as soon as we bought the house, you know, there was this thing that happened, like, we were looking for, I had a very specific idea of the bed frame that I wanted, and could, the only one that I found that was remotely close was like $9,000. I was like, paying $9,000 for a bed frame? I can make that. And I was like, a couple weeks later, I found myself, I realized I was sketching out my wood shop. <laughs> and I stopped, and I was like, <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> and I was, I was like, is that a law that 
every man who buys a house suddenly has to make must build, <laughs> must fix. <laughs> it's something genetic, right? <laughs> but I'm getting really excited about it, you know? Uh, and my, my uncle is actually, he teaches woodworking, so he's a great resource. It's always nice to have friends and family to help out. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we should turn our, our friends loose here and let them ask their questions. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, you can come up here to the microphone for us. Our Don't lovely, be shy. yes, our lovely sister here. You're number one. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of Hell on Wheels. I was wondering what it was like working on that show. Um, you know, like I, I said, it was a chapter in my life. I, my heart is very close to that show. It's very close to Colin Bohannon. Um, I have a lot of love for that show. I'm still in touch with a lot of those people. Um, I was just texting with Phil Burke, who played Mickey. He's gonna come up and hang with me because my wife's in Canada. John Worth was just at our set. We did a surprise second wedding ceremony, which we told everybody was a housewarming. John Worth, the showrunner, was there. As was Chad Oaks, the, the Calgary producer. Um, it, you know, I, the, the best part of Hell on Wheels is that it was all day's exterior, which is really a kind of, it's a producer's nightmare. I don't know of any other show that was all day's exterior. Uh, Lost was close, but they still had a studio. We had a studio the first two years, but the second year we used it all of five days. So we decided to save money on that and just do everything in the field. Because even those buildings we had, they were just clabbered set, set pieces, you know. They were functional buildings, but they were just bored. Um, and I, I want desperately to do something like that again. I want to do another Western. I'd love to work in Calgary again. I have family there now. And um, yeah, it was it was incredible getting paid to ride a horse and shoot a gun. Like, I'm surprised I would have paid them to let me do that. So it was great. Awesome, thank you. I, I have to interject here because I was auditioned for this role by by this guest here in her dress. And I don't know if you can see that dress, but it is a magnificent Star Trek dress. Nice. Sequins and badges and all, so. <laughs> Thank you for being one of my favorite captains. You did a great job. Thank you. So I'm actually, so obviously you did a lot of film work before you stepped into this kind of role. As you mentioned, uh, the Star Trek is a huge universe and now suddenly you're going, you know, at Comic-Con and you've got sort of this bigger following. And I kind of wonder how, or do you feel at all that sort of changed uh, yourself and how you're seen, how you're approached, that sort of thing? Um, the, the question is how, if it's changed what? So I kind of wonder, as an actor, is it changed how you're seen, how you're approached, how you're recognized, that sort of thing? Oh, um, not too much. I mean, like, at events like this, obviously people know who I am, or, you know, um, uh, or if I'm at a, a, a function where there's a red carpet, people will know who I am, and, you know, the, and scream my name. But, like, I don't walk in the kitchen and my wife goes, oh my god, it's hands and mouth. <laughs> 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 um, uh, you know, when I was doing Hell on Wheels and living in New York, um, I was incognito because I shaved. And it wasn't until I started getting ready to go back for another season, and I had about three weeks of growth, that, that that's when I started getting approached on the subway. Um, so I was, I had the best of all possible worlds until track, and now <laughs> Um, but I live in rural Connecticut where not a lot of people subscribe to CBS All Access. So, uh, <laughs> I'm there too. <laughs> and, and how has your wife taken on all this? Is, is, has she noticed the changes at all? Um, she doesn't really pay attention to too much of that stuff. She's kind of, she, she doesn't really pay an enormous amount of attention to pop culture, uh, nor does she really care about it. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Um, she doesn't get star starstruck. Um, she thinks it's cool, uh, and she celebrates with me when I have reason to celebrate. Um, but she kind of, you know, accepted that I was famous and I was an actor early on, and then that was really it. Um, 
Yeah. It sounds like she's a grounding force. A, you know, there was a learning curve, I think, for her when it came to uh, social media, mm -hmm. um, <gasps> trolls, and uh, a couple of stalker situations, but um, she's, she's cool with all of it. Excellent. Yeah. I, want, I forgot to tell you that you're the first Marvel Cinematic Universe character I've met. All right. And speaking of Marvel, I wanted to know if you could choose between Avengers and Guardians of the Galaxy, which team would you want to be on and why? I was asked a similar question at a Comic-Con, I think in Calgary, and uh, I had to say I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. Right. But they, they sounded like they were about to go get pitchforks. <laughs> I've been just too busy <laughs> to keep up, and I've been all over the place. Um, but I do intend to, to watch it. I've heard great things. Sorry, do you have another question? <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, don't worry, I'm not one of those pitchforks or keybladers after you. I, I'm just curious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Anson. Um, so I had a question about the uh, season two finale of Discovery. Okay. So uh, the, the transporters were working, right, at the end of that final battle with Control. <laughs> we, we, we know they sure. were because you were able to get Spock out of his shuttle. So um, okay. right. is there a reason why we didn't use those to save Admiral Cornwell? I mean, couldn't she have just flipped the lever and then gotten beamed out? I mean, why'd she have to die? See, when I asked that question, or a similar question, the usual response that I get from the higher-ups are, let's not worry about that. <laughs> just, it's a TV show. <laughs> I appreciate it. Because I often ask questions like that, but it's TV show. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, um, so I'm like I'm a closeted trans guy at home, and you know Pike was really like a warm, comforting, masculine presence for me. So how did you take like Pike, who was kind of cold in the cage, and like make him such a warm, inviting character? That's a good question. I guess I didn't think I didn't quite see it like that. I I don't think I didn't think of Pike in the cage as being cold. I, I thought of him as being a younger, a much younger man uh, who's has some real going through an existential crisis um, that is somewhat self-centered, as young men can be. I have been in the past and it's probably still am in some ways. Um, so, and I, and I didn't think about, so much about being warm um, as I did, I, I, I knew that Pike was Roddenberry's original vision for what a Starfleet ca captain should be. So I did know that on some level, he had to be the embodiment of Starfleet code and conduct. And so I kind of tried to do that, um, along with certain uh, clues I'd find in the material. Like he's, that first bridge scene, he gets everybody's name immediately um, and he asks them for their ideas. He's a man who knows his greatest asset is his crew. And so you want to treat your greatest asset with, with care. Um, so maybe maybe that's a cold way of uh, of of looking at it, but uh, I I appreciate that you saw it like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank cool. Thank you. Hi, I, I really enjoyed your work on the Inhumans. Thought it was great. Wanted to know how since. One of the actors' medium is your voice. How did you approach that part where you had no way of speaking other than communicating through hand motions? Well, that's the reason I did the job, is I wanted that challenge, you know? I like, I like OSHA roles. 
rolls them in. When I read them, I go, oh shit, how am I going to do that? Um, and I need that on a t-shirt. Yeah, and because also I realized immediately, I was like, okay, he wouldn't know ASL because he's not from Earth. So I'm going to have to create my own sign system. And that's just one of those nerdy things that I really love to geek out on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it, that part of it was a joy. Now, now, getting yourself from the brain-mouth connection to the brain-hand connection is another matter entirely. Now, if you watch these lovely ladies who are doing a great job, by the way. Um, they look, they, they move like similar to an orchestra conductor, which is one of the things I would go and do when I was getting ready for that role is watch the orchestra conductor. And there's a great concert in the Guggenheim around Christmas time where you can go around the loop and you can actually stand where you're facing the conductor. They move like dancers. They're fluid, there's a conservation of energy. And so I would rehearse my lines like uh, I was rehearsing a dance just to get it in the muscle memory of my body so I didn't have to think about it. Um, does that help? That's great, thanks. Yeah. Excellent question. Eyes up for Anson Mount, everybody. I, first of all, want to thank you for your excellent portrayal of uh, Captain Pike, and I wanted to ask you, I know you get this all the time in all the different conventions you go to, people asking you about the possibility of a Pike TV series. Never gotten that question. But seeing, <laughs> but seeing how uh, the next Star Trek movie has been sidelined, have you been approached to star in an upcoming Star Trek movie, perhaps involving Pike? Um, no. <laughs> and if I were, I would not be able to divulge that information. Um, no, they're not, no, they're not going to Look, this is a numbers game, all right? And these decisions are made by people with MBAs, not MFAs. And so they're not gonna, they're not gonna put me in, in a movie as a lead and put it on 4,000 screens. They're not gonna do it. It's, it's uh, you know, it, if, if they decide it makes financial sense to do a, a Pike spinoff, I'd love, I'd be very open to talking to them about it. But um, you know about as much as I do in that regard. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. I do know that they're listening. You know, they are, they, are, they are noticing what people are saying on social media. And um, so, it, you know, if you, if you want it, talk about it, tweet it, write about it. Um, it does, you know, they are listening. So, we'll see. I don't know. I need a job at some point. <laughs> Sounds like we need to start doing our own work here. Thank you and good luck. We'll be signing the petition for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hi. Um, when you got the part of Pike, uh, did you get any advice from Colin Meany and do you have any stories about working with him? Um, you know, I, I met to, I went to, Colin was doing a play on Broadway. He was doing Iceman Cometh with Denzel last summer. Uh, and I, no, was it last? It was, yeah, it was in the middle of my hiatus from, from the season. And I had meant to talk to him about Star Trek, uh, but it was his birthday, it turns out, and he took me out and got me ridiculously drunk. So, I think that's a story in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we, I mean, we had chatted about it uh, every now and then because on Hell and Wheels, um, our, our DP, Marvin Rush, was uh, a camera op on uh, Next Generation and then uh, DP and sometimes director on Deep Space Nine. So they, um, occasionally it came up. Uh, but I never thought that I would end up in Star Trek, so, you know, it, it was never a cause for a conversation uh, other than my own fandom. And now, I've done it, and I'm doing these conventions, and I still haven't fucking run into Colomini. <laughs> I 
I've seen everybody else, but he and I keep missing each other like a day. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to because he's a he's a great he's a great guy. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your portrayal of Pike. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, besides Captain Pike, who's your favorite captain and why? Wow. Well, you know, I get that question a lot. Um, and I, you know, I grew up with Kirk, so that's an easy answer, but I love watching Picard. Um, and I'm kind of like, you know, it's like asking me, between those two guys, it's like, at what, do you, it's like asking me, would you rather have balls or brains? And I'm like, <laughs> why not both? <laughs> Uh, any funny or memorable moments from the filming of Discovery? I get that question a lot too. Um, and the, the, the thing that usually comes to mind is I, uh, Sonequa likes to, when I'm least expecting it, she likes to tackle hug me from behind and it makes me scream like a little girl. She, does, <laughs> she thinks that's real funny. So, God, I, it it is, so I, never, I never get wise to it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that, and um, I, you know, every day is a riot with Jonathan Frakes when he's directing. So yeah, we, we always, he, I make fun of him for the way he, because he, he likes to be on set, because he's a fucking actor. And <laughs> he doesn't like to go back and be Billy Village, he has a little monitor on the set, and when it gets to the end of a shot, you know, he likes to let the camera linger for, I don't know, extra material or for to extend his possibilities for cut points. And you'll always, you'll be holding a moment and you'll hear Jonathan Frakes going, yes. <laughs> and we're in the moment. And yes, the camera floats by. It's and the whole time you're like, <laughs> and then and then and then he'll shout, Capri! <laughs> Excellent. All righty. So we're at Silicon Valley Comic Con today, and in this particular convention is unique in that it tries to marry not only pop culture, uh, cinema, but also technology and innovation. Is there an innovation, uh, something coming, or, or something that you've seen, or something that you know you dreamt of as a, a young Star Trek fan that's on the horizon that you're not only intrigued about, but excited about and hoping becomes more fruition? Well, I, I like to read physics. And that, and that doesn't mean I read equations. <laughs> okay. I read, I read, I like to read books by physicists that are written for the layman. Um, and I was just talking to, to Spiros, uh, uh, Michaela, Michaelkes? Yes. Yeah, Spiro, you're here? Yeah. Spiro, you're here? Over here. Uh, okay. Did I get, did I get your name wrong? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Michaelkes? Okay. All right. Sorry, but we we're just we we're just talking, um, and uh, <laughs> there's this this book I love by a physicist named Max Tegmark who makes an argument for a model of the universe, um, and it's a, it was a very controversial idea uh, that um, you know we've all, we've said for thousands, hundreds of years, we've said, wow, physics, physics, the universe seems, mathematics seems to predict physics, it seems to predict the way the world works. And he's the, the first guy who said, well, what if we turn that idea on its head? What if the universe is a mathematical construct? And, uh, and Spiros was uh, talking about this and a couple of other crazy ideas, and he was like, that's crazy, this the other idea is crazy. But now this guy, Max Tegmark, who you were just talking about, that, that he has this idea that's even crazier about math, the universe being mathematical function, but he is right. <laughs> I was like, 
really? <laughs> and then he explained to me, and my head was blown. Um, so I, 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 I think that there is. Uh, I was talking about. I was talking with the Waz yesterday about the the marriage of um, entertainment, human curiosity, and engineering, and just in human endeavor. And he sees uh, um, tremendous potential in that. I mean, like you know, we're we're to also Spiros and I were talking about the momentum of discovery that's going on right now. Um, it's incredible, and it's just about to get faster. And I think that, especially with the advent of, of AI helping us to do this, I think it, it is very, very important to keep our mind, our mind's eye on ethics as, and, and philosophy, as well as development. And that's why one of the th reasons that I love Star Trek is because it isn't just a fan base. It is a community, it is a, it is a culture unto its own. Because you know the reason we have storytelling, the reason we have mythology, is that it helps us expand the tribe. And human tribes from the outset matched the numbers of, of chimpanzee tribes. And then something happened that allowed our numbers to grow per tribe and we were able to eradicate the Cro-Magnon, for instance. And this course of numbers growing developed with language. So what mythology does for us is it allows us to expand the concept of what we means. Um, and everything else that binds us together is mythology, but I don't see mythology as a, as a, as a negative frame to look at, at, at us. I, you know, there is no such thing as a nation, but nations do exist. There's no such thing as money, but money does exist and helps us to form a more cohesive, more productive world. Um, Star Trek is mythology, but it is real. And I thank you for letting me be in your house today and for letting me part, be part of your tribe. That's all I got to say.